Story number one. In early 2020, just as COVID was starting to upend our lives, my husband Mark took on an overnight job. Like many families, we were scrambling to keep things steady, and the night shift offered a bit more pay to help us stay afloat. The hours were brutal, 9 p.m. to 6 a.m., and he'd only been at it for a couple of weeks when something strange happened. One evening, he left around 8.15 p.m. as usual, kissing our daughter Emma and me goodbye before heading out. With remote school and the stress of the pandemic, we tried to create little moments of normalcy whenever we could. That night, Emma and I decided to have a cozy movie night together, complete with popcorn, blankets, and hot chocolate, trying to forget for a while how much things had changed. It was around 11 p.m. when I heard the unmistakable sound of Mark's keys at the back door. It was such a specific noise, the jingle of his worn Buffalo Bills keychain, and then his usual shuffle as he came in. I figured he must have forgotten something, and sure enough, there he was, standing in the kitchen, still in his work uniform with his company logo, just visible under his jacket. Forgot my knee sleeve, he said, rubbing his right knee, a sore spot from an old football injury. Can't make it through the shift without it. His voice had that slight raspiness it always got during night shifts, probably from the cold warehouse air. I noticed he was wearing the blue work jacket I just washed that weekend. I could still smell the lavender fabric softener I always used. He walked down the hall toward our bedroom, his work boots making that familiar scuffing sound against our hardwood floors, calling a quick, hey princess, to Emma as he passed. She gave him a sleepy wave from under her blanket. I heard him go upstairs, seven steps, then that one creaky floorboard he always hit outside our bedroom. Then rummage around for a minute, the sound of our dresser drawers opening and closing, exactly where he kept his knee sleeve. Then he came back down, taking the stairs two at a time, like he always did when he was in a hurry. He gave me a quick kiss goodbye, his beard scratchy against my cheek, the faint smell of his coffee lingering, mixed with that spearmint gum he'd started chewing to stay awake during shifts, before heading back out. Emma and I finished our movie, did the usual bedtime routine, and went to bed. Nothing felt strange, nothing felt wrong. It was just a quick stop to grab something he'd forgotten, and then he was back to work. The next morning, as he was having his coffee, I casually asked about his knee and if the sleeve had helped him get through the shift. He looked at me, genuinely confused. What are you talking about? He asked, raising an eyebrow. When you came home last night, I replied, for your knee sleeve? Around 11? His confusion deepened. I didn't come home last night. I worked straight through. We were doing inventory. I didn't even take a break. I laughed, thinking he was playing a joke. You definitely did. Emma saw you too. You called her princess when you walked by, remember? Emma, who was finishing her breakfast, nodded. Yeah, Dad. You said goodnight. Mark's face grew serious, and he shook his head. I swear I didn't come home last night. I couldn't have. I never left the store. The room went silent. My hands trembled as I pulled out my phone to check the security camera footage. We'd installed a whole system during the pandemic for added peace of mind. I pulled up the backdoor camera footage from that night and found the clip of him leaving at 8.15 p.m., just like I remembered. But at 11 p.m., nothing. No movement at all. I checked every camera, the front door, back door, side gate. There was nothing, no indication that anyone had entered the house. Yet Emma and I had both seen him, both heard him, and I knew I'd felt him kiss me goodbye before he walked out the door. For days, I couldn't stop replaying it in my mind, trying to make sense of what we'd experienced. I scoured the internet for logical explanations. We had working carbon monoxide detectors in every room, so it wasn't hallucinations. I tested the security cameras myself and found no glitches or gaps. Mark even checked with his co-workers, and sure enough, he hadn't left the store at all that night. Later that year, we moved out of that house. We never discussed it much after that, but sometimes I catch Emma watching her dad carefully when he comes home late, as if making sure it's really him. Story number two. I don't believe in ghosts. I never have. When people tell me their ghost stories, I usually find myself mentally picking apart their experiences, finding the logical explanations they might have missed. Carbon monoxide, sleep paralysis, house settling. There's always an explanation. 
But something happened during a family camping trip in New Mexico when I was 13 that I still can't explain, no matter how hard I try. And believe me, I've tried. It was late August 1996, and my family had found this perfect campsite next to a stream in the Carson National Forest, the kind of place you see in camping magazines. Tall pines, clear water, burbling over rocks, stars bright enough to read by. My parents had their tent set up about 20 feet from where my brother James and I had ours. Nothing felt off about the place. If anything, it felt almost too perfect. That evening, we'd done all the classic camping things. Hot dogs over the fire, s'mores, ghost stories that seemed silly in the moment. When it was time for bed, I got into my sleeping bag and put on my Walkman, listening to music while James read his book by flashlight. It must have been around 10.30 when I decided to call it a night. I remember the exact moment everything changed. I'd just taken off my headphones and was drifting off when I became aware of a sound. It was subtle at first, just a light swishing or scratching against the tent's exterior. My first thought was that it must be grass moving in the wind. But then I realized something that made my stomach drop. There wasn't any wind. The air was completely still. The sound continued, methodical and deliberate, like someone or something, dragging their fingers across the tent's surface. Jay, I whispered, using my brother's nickname. What is that? What's what? He asked, lowering his book. I pointed toward the sound, which was now moving slowly along the side of the tent. James reached out and tapped the spot with his hand, probably thinking the same thing I had about grass or a loose guy line. What happened next is burned into my memory. Whatever was out there immediately tapped back, matching the exact rhythm of my brother's tap. The sound was sharp and distinct, nothing like grass or branches. We lost it. Both of us started screaming, scrambling backward in our sleeping bags. The scratching got more intense, moving faster around the tent wall. I can still hear the sound, like dry fingers dragging across nylon, but somehow wrong, like the timing between scratches was just slightly off from what it should have been. My parents came running from their tent, flashlights bobbing in the darkness. Dad kept saying it had to be a bug or some vegetation caught in the tent's exterior. Mom suggested it might be a guy line tapping against the tent. They were trying to be rational, to calm us down, but I could hear the uncertainty in their voices. Dad walked around the outside of the tent with his flashlight, examining every inch. Nothing. No branches, no loose strings, no large insects. They even took everything out of the tent and shook it, thinking something might be caught in the fabric. There was nothing. The scratching had a pattern to it that still haunts me. Sometimes it would move in perfect circles around the tent, taking exactly the same time to complete each rotation. Other times, it would zip from one corner to another, from ground level to the peak of the tent, faster than any animal could move. The sound itself would change too. One moment it would be light, almost tentative, like fingernails barely grazing the fabric. The next it would become more aggressive, pressing hard enough that we could see the tent material indent, but never enough to tear it. What made it even more unsettling was how it seemed to react to us. When we'd fall silent, it would slow down, becoming almost playful. Tap, tap, pause, scratch, scratch. But the moment we'd speak or move, it would intensify, as if excited by our presence. Once James tried to time the pattern with his watch, thinking maybe it was something mechanical we couldn't see, but the timing was never consistent. It was erratic yet deliberate, random yet purposeful like it was trying to communicate something we couldn't understand. I was hysterical by this point. Even at 13, I knew this wasn't normal. This wasn't the wind or a bug or any of the logical explanations my parents were trying to find. Mom finally took me to their tent while Dad stayed with James. I didn't sleep at all that night. Every few minutes, I'd hear James and Dad talking in low voices from the other tent. The next morning, they told us the scratching had continued all night long. Sometimes it would stop for a few minutes, giving them hope it was over, then start again in a different spot. Dad, who was always the skeptic in our family, so he tried to approach it scientifically, marking the spots where the scratching was strongest with his flashlight beam. By morning, he had mentally mapped out its movements, but the pattern made no sense. 
It defied any natural movement pattern he knew of. No animal moves that way, he said. Nothing moves that way. Dad was convinced we'd find scratches, tears, or at least some kind of mark that would explain what we'd heard. But the tent's surface was pristine, not a single scratch or scuff mark anywhere. We packed up and left after that quick examination of the tent in the morning. No one suggested staying another night. Story number three. A few years ago, I went through one of the most stressful periods of my life. And during that time, I started having a recurring nightmare. In the dream, a pitch black parasite clung to my chest, sucking the life out of me. It felt heavy, like it was pulling something vital from deep inside me. The worst part was that I never saw it come or go. It would just be there, waiting in the dark corners, lurking until I went to bed. Every night, the dream played out the same way. I'd feel paralyzed, unable to scream or move as the parasite latched onto me, draining my energy. I'd wake up gasping, clutching my chest and drenched in sweat. It always left me feeling completely exhausted, as if whatever life it took in the dream carried over into the real world. What made it even stranger were my cats. Normally, they each had their own sleeping spots. One preferred the couch, another liked the windowsill, and the last would hide under the coffee table. But during this time, they all started sleeping on my bed. Every night, without fail, all three would crowd around me, curling up close to my chest. It was like they were standing guard, surrounding me as if they knew something I didn't. At first, I found it comforting, like they were trying to help me through a tough time. But as the nightmares got worse, their behavior started to feel eerie. They were always alert, their heads snapping toward every small creek or shadow. I couldn't help but wonder, were they protecting me from whatever was in my dream? The nightmares weren't the only thing bothering me. During the day, I developed this itch right in the center of my chest, the same spot where I felt the parasite in my dream. I scratched at it constantly, but the itch never went away. I tried to tell myself it was just stress, maybe some weird allergic reaction, but deep down, it felt like something more. Then one day, while rubbing at the itch, I felt it, a small, pea-sized lump just beneath the skin on my chest. A chill ran down my spine. It was right in the exact place where the parasite latched on in my nightmare. I tried to brush it off, hoping it would disappear on its own. But the itch persisted, and the lump didn't budge. Eventually, I gave in and scheduled a doctor's appointment. I needed peace of mind, even if it was just to prove to myself that it was nothing. When the doctor examined the lump, I noticed their expression change. They ordered a biopsy immediately just to be safe. I sat in the sterile room, waiting feeling the weight of their words sink in. It's probably nothing, they said, but we need to be sure. A few agonizing days later, the results came back. I was diagnosed with male breast cancer at the age of 28. The news hit me hard, like a punch I never saw coming. Cancer wasn't even something I'd considered. I didn't know anyone my age dealing with it, and male breast cancer felt like something I'd only ever heard about in rare cases. The next few months were a blur. Treatments, surgeries, hospital visits. It was exhausting in every way imaginable. But I fought through it, determined to get better. And then something strange happened. After my treatment ended and I was officially cancer-free, the nightmares stopped. Just like that. I never had the dream again. It felt like the parasite in my dream had been waiting for me to find the lump. And once I did, its purpose was fulfilled. Even stranger... My cats went back to their usual routines the moment I recovered. They stopped sleeping on my bed entirely, returning to their old spots, the couch, the windowsill, and the coffee table. It was as if their job was done and they no longer needed to watch over me. I'll never fully understand what happened during that time, but I'm grateful for how it all played out. I caught the cancer early, fought through it, and got a second chance at life. But I'll always feel a strange gratitude toward those three cats, who somehow knew exactly when I needed them the most. Story number four. Around 20 years back, not long after we moved into a rental house in a quiet rural Virginia town, I decided to explore the area behind our property. It was wild land, overgrown brush and trees that hadn't been touched in years. 
And just past that was an old quarry filled with water. The locals said the quarry was dangerous. They warned that if you stepped into it, the drop was sudden, 60 feet straight down, and you'd be swallowed by the dark water without a chance to come back up. Even though it creeped me out, my sister and I used to roam the area all the time. The quarry was the most interesting spot around, though I was always careful not to get too close to the edge. One afternoon, while wandering along the side of the quarry, I stumbled across something strange. There, on the ground, was an old backpack, dirty and stiff from being left out in the elements for who knows how long. The zippers were rusted, and the fabric was weather-worn. Curious, I opened it up. Inside, I found several N64 cartridges, all of them scratched and worn, like they had been tossed aside and forgotten. It immediately struck me as odd. This was 2004, and even though the N64 was old by then, most kids still held on to their games because they were expensive. In a town like ours where most families didn't have much money, video games were a big deal. No one would leave them lying around like this. And that wasn't all. Right next to the backpack was a set of clothes, spread out on the ground in a way that gave me chills. The pants and shirt were laid out perfectly, as if someone had been lying in them and just disappeared. It didn't look random. It felt deliberate. The clothes were soaked and faded, with the kind of wear that comes from sitting through seasons of rain and sun. The fabric had stiffened, the colors drained by time. I stared at them for a moment, trying to make sense of what I was seeing. There was no backpacker, no camper, no sign that anyone had been living in the area. Just the old clothes laid out like an empty person and a backpack full of outdated games. I felt uneasy, like I had interrupted something, like I wasn't supposed to be there. I didn't stick around for long. I ran back home and told my parents what I'd found. At first, they thought I was probably imagining things or overreacting. But when I described the way the clothes were arranged, they decided to call the police just to be safe. The officers arrived later that day, and I led them back to the spot by the quarry. Everything was still exactly where I had found it. Nothing disturbed. The cops searched the area for a while, poking through the brush, but they didn't find anything else. No footprints, no signs of a camp or anyone living out there. They collected the backpack and clothes and asked around the neighborhood, but no one had heard anything about anyone going missing. Our neighbors were mostly elderly, and there hadn't been any missing person reports in years. No adults, no children. It didn't make sense for it to be a prank either. People around here didn't have much money, and I couldn't imagine anyone wasting their N64 games like that. It was as if the things had just been left there, waiting to be found. The cops never searched the quarry. Since they had no reason to believe a crime had been committed, they didn't see a need to drag the water. They told us they'd run the items through their system, but we never heard anything back. No matches, no follow-ups, just silence. The whole thing felt like it had been swept under the rug. My sister and I kept going out to explore the area after that, but we avoided that spot by the quarry. We didn't talk about it much, but we both felt the same way. It was just wrong. Something about it creeped us out, even though nothing more ever happened. As far as I know, we left there after a year ago. Whatever was out there, whatever story those clothes and cartridges held, was never solved. Story number five. Back around 2008, I was living near my college in an apartment tucked back from the main road. The whole complex sat in a wooded, hilly area, far enough away from traffic to feel a bit isolated. I loved running, and most evenings I'd go for a jog around the neighborhood, usually just before sundown. It was the perfect way to clear my head. One night, near the end of my run, I was making my way up the last hill behind my apartment. It was getting darker, but I knew this area well and wasn't too worried. As I approached the base of the hill, I glanced ahead to the top and noticed three guys on bikes just sitting there, lined up and facing in my direction. Immediately, my spidey senses started tingling. Something about the way they were just sitting there, completely still, not moving or talking, made me uneasy. As a 20-year-old woman alone, it set off every alarm bell in my brain. I told myself I was overreacting, though. It was probably nothing. Maybe they were just resting, right? I shook it off and kept running. But the further I climbed up the hill, the worse the pit in my stomach grew. The guys hadn't moved an inch. They were still sitting there, facing me, 
as if they were waiting. I didn't have my phone on me, just shorts, a tank top, and a pair of running shoes. There was nowhere else to go, no detours or alternate routes. It was either push forward or turn back, and going back would take me further from home. I decided to run as hard as I could, thinking that if anything went wrong, I'd scream at the top of my lungs. I figured maybe someone in the complex might hear me. I tried to focus on my breathing and keep my head down, but the fear was clawing its way to the surface. Then, just as I was halfway up the hill, I heard movement beside me. My heart jumped into my throat. I whipped my head to the right, and that's when I saw him, a German shepherd running stride for stride with me. I had never seen this dog before. No collar, no owner in sight, just this big, muscular shepherd appearing out of nowhere. I can't explain it, but the second I saw him, this wave of calm washed over me. It was like some part of me knew I'd be okay now. The fear I'd felt just moments ago started to melt away, replaced by an overwhelming sense of security. He stayed right beside me, matching my pace perfectly. I didn't stop or slow down, I just kept running, with him right there, as if he belonged to me. As we got closer to the top of the hill, the guys on the bikes came into full view. That's when the dog did something strange. Instead of staying by my side, he surged ahead, moving just slightly in front of me. Then, as we reached the three guys, the dog planted himself directly in front of me, positioning himself between me and them. He didn't growl or bark, he just stood there, solid as a wall blocking their path. I kept my eyes straight ahead and didn't make any effort to look at the guys. I could feel them watching me, but I wasn't about to stop or slow down. With the dog in front, I passed the group without a word, keeping my focus on the road ahead. As soon as I was a few steps past them, the dog turned and trotted back to my side, falling in step with me again. He didn't look back at the guys and neither did I. We just kept running. When I reached the entrance to my apartment's parking lot, a brightly lit area that felt safe, the dog slowed down almost as if he knew his job was done. I turned to say thank you or at least get a better look at him. But before I could, he slipped into the trees beside the parking lot and disappeared. It was like he had come out of nowhere, and now he was gone just as quickly. I stayed in the parking lot for a minute, catching my breath and trying to wrap my head around what had just happened. I felt like I had been in danger, and somehow this dog had shown up at exactly the right moment to protect me. After that night, I took the same route every evening at the same time, hoping I'd see him again. I even drove along the road during the day, scanning the area for any sign of him, but I never saw the dog again, not once. When I told my friends about it, they were convinced he was some kind of guardian angel, sent to make sure I stayed safe that night. I'm not really a believer in that kind of thing, so I didn't know what to make of it. But there was no denying how strange it was. I hadn't seen the dog before or since, and he had shown up at exactly the moment I needed him. I don't know if he was just a stray or something more, but whatever the case, I'll always be grateful. That dog made sure I got home safely, and I'll never forget it. Story number six. It was a regular Saturday night. I was home alone with my two dogs watching TV when I heard a banging sound coming from the basement. It was loud, like someone slamming the appliances down there. The kind of noise that makes you stop and listen. I wasn't immediately scared, though. There's no way into the basement except from the main floor, and I knew no one had come inside without me noticing. I figured it had to be something else, though I couldn't imagine what. One of my dogs, Meathead, the kind that tries to fight everything he sees, heard the noise too. Without hesitation, he bolted straight down the stairs. I followed right after him, more curious than anything, though I was already wondering what I'd find. Was it an animal? Maybe something fell? But what I saw when I got downstairs made my stomach drop. It wasn't a falling object or a trapped animal. It was my other dog, slamming his head between the dryer and the chest freezer. Over and over, he rammed his head into the metal appliances, panning hard, almost hyperventilating. Meathead stood off to the side, just watching him, looking as confused as I was. I rushed over and grabbed my dog, trying to pull him away from the machines. He was frantic, shaking and out of control, like I'd never seen before. It took a moment to calm him down, and even then I could feel how off everything felt. 
I knew my dogs, if they lost a toy or smelled something weird, they'd whine or bark for me to help. But this, this was something else entirely. After a few minutes, we all went back upstairs, and I tried to shake the weird feeling creeping over me. I thought maybe there was some logical explanation. Something stuck behind the appliances, or maybe a rodent. But I knew it didn't fit. We'd never had any pest problems in the basement or anywhere else in the house. And it wasn't like my dogs to act this way. Then 30 minutes later, the banging started again. My heart jumped, and I immediately looked at the dog who'd been slamming his head earlier. But he was lying down calmly, though his ears were perked. He was aware of the noise, too. That's when I realized it was Meathead now causing the ruckus downstairs. We sprinted down to the basement, and sure enough, there he was, slamming his head between the same dryer and chest freezer. Just like my other dog had earlier, he was frenzied, panting hard, his whole body tense as he banged his head against the machines. I grabbed him as quickly as I could, pulling him away from the appliances before he hurt himself. It was like he didn't even recognize me at first, still thrashing for a moment, before I got him to settle down. Once he stopped, we all went back upstairs again. The whole thing left me shaken. I knew this wasn't normal behavior. I spent the next few days researching, thinking maybe it was a medical issue, something like a brain tumor. But two dogs acting that way on the same night, with no signs of illness before or after? It didn't make sense. If it had been a toy or a treat stuck between the machines, they would have just whined until I got it for them. This was something entirely different. It's been three years since that night, and nothing like it has ever happened again. My dogs have been perfectly healthy. No weird behavior, no more frenzies. And the basement? It's still the same. Just a regular, well-kept space. There's never been anything strange about it, except for that one night. Thanks for watching. Don't leave before leaving a like to this video. Also hit the subscribe button to support my work. And as always, have a horrific nightmare, my dear.